An introduction to GBI, Grace Bible Institute, a place for information, transformation, and impartation. When you choose Grace Bible Institute, you have chosen biblical information, transformation, and impartation for a meaningful Christian walk, worthy of the calling with which you are called. Our primary goal at GBI is to convey foundational Bible truth to ordinary saints, such truth which is hidden in theological seminaries far away beyond that which many well-meaning believers could ever afford. Enroll with us and find the content and the confidence with which you can defend and confirm the truth in love. You are welcome. So I hope we have had a nice time since the last time we are here. And uh, I'm told uh, last lesson you enjoyed Greek a lot. Now you are becoming uh, Greek scholars. <laughs> so now you're putting me in trouble because I have to be very careful how I teach the word. Because now you will start uh, interpreting me as I teach the word. And this is, uh, this is almost our last lesson in the unit concerning soteriology. It's almost our last lesson. Uh, because what will remain after that, after today, it will be just maybe looking at uh, the difficult passages of the Bible. Uh, we have many passages in the Bible that seem to say a believer can lose his salvation. And those are the passages we'll be looking at next, if the Lord allows. But we need to move on. We are too slow. So we are, we are looking at uh, the assurance of salvation. We looked at the finished work of the cross. We looked at the security of salvation. And now we are looking at the assurance of salvation. And as we look at the assurance of salvation, uh, this lesson seeks to address the age-old concern as to whether you can know with absolute certainty that you are saved forever. You see, the security of salvation is just to tell you that your salvation is secure. Your salvation is secure. But we have the question, am I actually saved? And if you have never reached a point that you, you really doubt if you are saved, then keep on growing. Most of us, even preachers, Things can happen in your life and you ask yourself, uh, am I really saved? And that's what we want to address today, to answer the question, how do I know with absolute, how can I know certainty that I am saved forever? I'm saved forever. Sometimes we know we are saved for today. Sometimes we wonder if we tomorrow will be saved. <laughs> so that's what we are looking at. So by, by the end of this, this lesson, we should have uh, attained the necessary assets to really understand that we are saved forever. There are many times your, your Christian experiences have caused many doubts and confusion to the level that you lost the assurance of salvation, of your salvation. Our Christian experiences uh, can cause a lot of doubts in our life. A lot of doubts in our life. To the level that you lose even that feeling that there is a God in heaven, that there is a Father who loves me. If someone tells you God loves you, you say, like, uh, I don't think that is true. So we have experiences in life. Gilbert said you. So many experiences in life that you, you, you get confused. So God is, however, very clear in his word that the person who has believed in Christ Jesus can be absolutely sure that he is saved forever. So we want to draw uh, the assurance of salvation from scriptures, from the word of God. Because the only place that a believer can go to and be sure of what he's learning is the scriptures. 
So, relax. The question we have been asked in many training colleges is that if you are a father, and since you are a father, so let's look at it. If your child comes to you and asks you, am I your child? What do you answer him? Yes, you are my child. And you can even explain to him the day you married the mother, the day he was conceived, if you know. You can explain when you took the mother to the hospital to, to give birth, how you gave the name and how you brought up the child. You can even explain to the child. But after explaining, and after a month or so, the child comes and asks you, am I really your child? What happens? Eh? You call the mother. <laughs> Ask the mother, what have you been telling this child? <laughs> so what, what, what you mean is that this child has been uh, listening to alternative voices. For the child to doubt that is your child and you are the father, and to keep on asking, then there must be a voice, an alternative voice somewhere that is instructing him. And most believers have listened to alternative voices apart from the voice of God that assures us continually that you are my children. You are my children. So that's what we are looking at today. How can God assure us that we are his children? In Hebrews 6.11, the Bible says, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. So the word we are looking for is here, assurance of hope until the end. So you need to ask yourself, what is this full assurance of hope until the end? What is that? It's being fully assured, hope here, being confidently expectant of your eternity with God in heaven at the end of the human history. You are confident. That's what the, the, the writer of Hebrew desires, that each one of you show the same diligence, diligence to the full assurance. You need to be fully assured that you have the eternal hope. That you have the eternal hope. And the word hope we have always defined it as confident expectation. This is not maybe or maybe not. No. When you hear hope as an English word, you may say, I hope I'll get some money. Or I hope I'll get married. You may get married or not get married. But when you see the word hope in the Bible, it's, it's, it's telling you this is a certainty. You are expecting something that will certainly come to pass. That's how hope is used in the Bible. So, in Hebrews 10, 22, the Bible says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So we have here also full assurance of faith. Faith is a persuasion that is based on biblical facts. A persuasion based on the word of God that you have learned and believed. So that's faith. You are persuaded beyond doubt. That's why you will hear Paul say sometimes, this is true and not a lie. You are persuaded that this is it. And you cannot just say, I have faith. Faith always has an object. And the object of our faith is the either the Lord Jesus Christ as the living word, or the Bible as the written word. The writer of Hebrews again wants you to have full assurance of faith. This, however, depends on two vital aspects of Christianity. So we have, number one, a clear understanding of the gospel, and number two, the evidence of a transformed life. These are the two things that can help you have an assurance of salvation. A clear understanding of the gospel, and uh, a transformed life, an evidence of a transformed life. If the gospel you have is gabbled, is a mixture of human traditions and biblical truth, 
If the gospel you have is a mixture of religious, denominational uh, doctrines and Bible truth, if the gospel you have is a mixture of some legalism here and truth here, you can never ever have the assurance of your salvation. You need to reach a level that you have a clarity with the gospel. And we're going to look at it briefly uh, here because we have gone through the gospel several times. So just look at it briefly. Every member of the human race is born a sinner as a result of the original disobedience of Adam in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> Every member of the human race. So the gospel begins by us understanding that we are affected by what one person did. Not by what we did. What one person did in the Garden of Eden. You see, if you begin there, it will not be hard for you to understand that you are also reconciled back to God by what one person did. One person in the Garden of Eden, on a tree, he ate from a tree, and a person at Calvary hanged on a tree, and it changed the whole life. So we begin there with the gospel. If you go to the book of Genesis, you can read all about this. We have done that. We have done Genesis chapter 1 up to 3 with clarity here. So you, if you can't remember, or if you are new, you can go to the YouTube, uh, uh, YouTube channel, Grace for Transformation Kenya, and look at uh, the teaching on uh, anthropology, eh? the creation of man, the fall of man, and... Uh, uh, yeah, I think the Christian and follow man. Uh, we we learned two things. We say the uh, we say that uh, what is anthropology? The doctrine of man, and then uh, hermetology, the doctrine of sin. So we said what? Without a clear and understanding of hermetology, we cannot understand soteriology. So all human beings possess a corrupt sin nature that willfully and continually rebels, violates, or is hostile to God's holy requirements. So we need to understand that every single human being, every single human being possesses a hostile, corrupt, defiled sin nature. Every single human being. There's no exception. There's no exception. All human beings, every single member of the human race has that. Romans 3, 10 to 12, as it is written, there is none, you need to note that, none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside, they have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. This scripture is true of all humanity before the cross. You cannot preach this in the church today because the, in the church we have people who, who, who have the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. But this is true of the entire humanity before salvation before salvation. That's something that we need to put at heart. If you go to Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 and uh, chapter 8 verse 21, you will see that truth. Do you have the Bible? You got the Bible, okay. So Genesis chapter 6 verse 5, let's just look at Genesis chapter 6 verse 5. If you look at Genesis chapter 6 verse 5, the Bible says, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent Look at that. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil for some time. Oh, evil continually. <laughs> That's how God looked at man. Every single human being after the fall of Adam, everybody who followed before Christ died on, dies on the cross and the work of salvation becomes, this is true of every single human being. Chapter 8, verse 21. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said to his heart, I will, ne I will never again cast the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. 
nor will, he, will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. So the imaginations, the thoughts of every man, they are evil from when you are young. You are born with an evil imagination, evil mindset. Every single human being is born with an evil, wicked mindset. Why? Because of the corrupt nature that we inherited from Adam. Okay. There is a time I, I actually asked you the same, same question. Yes. And this year where I don't understand at all. Because yeah. uh -huh. uh, you say life before the cross, life after the cross. And you find life before the cross, there is that, you know, God looks at man with that kind of, you know, and his thoughts, his intents are evil continually. Now after the cross, mm -hmm. because that one you will find as, as the sin nature, mm -hmm. which sometimes back when I asked you, you told me that uh, although we are saved, but that nature still remains. Now, if it still remains, does it actually mean that uh, we still have that kind of uh, looking, you know, having that evil intent every okay. time? Do we still have that evil intent every time? And uh, if we still have that evil intent every time, what was actually the consequence of Christ's work on the cross to mm. us? Okay. Yes, if now actually at all, the sin nature remains. Okay. When we look at the next level of, uh, maybe after this, if we have another unit of sociology, we look at what other people teach concerning the same. Okay. And I know there are so many people who teach outside there that uh, once, born, once you are born again, you are completely righteous, body, soul, and spirit, and therefore the sin nature is no longer there. That's a very dangerous teaching, my brother. Very dangerous teaching. Because someone telling you you can leave your door open because there are no thieves in Nairobi, all thieves got born again. Eh? But let's look at it. Let's look at it. Even the simple scripture like uh, what we have been covering in church, Galatians chapter 5 verse 16, says, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So what is that? Verse 17 says, for the spirit and the flesh are at battle with one another. You see that? You see that? So anybody who tells you that, Ephesians says, put on the new man, put off the old man. You as your responsibility, not God to do it for you. You as your own responsibility. So what we need to understand is that when you get born again, the sin nature is not taken away, but the sin nature is rendered inoperative in your life because of the power of the Holy Spirit, which is higher than that of the whole sin nature. The, the sin nature is stripped of its controlling authority over you. So you are not under the control of sin anymore, but under the control of the Holy Spirit. But willingly, you can choose that sin was better, is better than the Holy Spirit, and you subject yourself under sin. That's why there's the big question, do believers still sin? Have you seen a believer who is still doing evil things? You, you've seen them. So from whence, where are they getting that strength to do evil things? It's from the sin nature that operates through the flesh. And that's why if you look at the, what we'll be doing in the afternoon, maybe we can spare that for afternoon, there is the salvation of the spirit, the soul, and the body. You see? We'll look at it in the afternoon. But every uh, maybe dogmatically, we, we were talking with George when we were coming, and we are saying that what we are doing is very important because the grace fraternity needs to have its own way of looking at the Bible and defending what we believe biblically, and even understanding and interpreting it even in the original languages, the Hebrew, the Greek, the Aramaic, so that when we say this is what we believe, we have a, a point of reference in the scripture, and even the right hermeneutics in interpreting the word of God. So that's what we were looking at with my brother George when we were coming. But what we need to understand is that if you have to clearly explain more scriptures in the Bible, you need to understand that a man is body, soul, and spirit. Okay? 
What happened in the Garden of Eden? He was body, soul, and spirit. So, did the body die in the Garden of Eden? Did the soul die in the Garden of Eden? Is the spirit that died in the Garden of Eden. After the death of the spirit, did the man continue living and acting and doing things? Yes, he did. But was he, was he a sinner now? He was a sinner. He carried the sinful nature. When you believe in Christ Jesus, God does not begin with your body. He does not begin with your soul. He begins with that which died in the Garden of Eden. You see, he creates in you a new spirit man first. Then now from the new spirit man, he is able to operate in your life and come to your soul and come to your flesh. Make some scientific sense, eh? Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> So do we carry the sin nature? Yes. Is it the sin nature supposed to rule us? No. Because we have a higher law that we are living by, which is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Okay. Do, do, we, do we have the law of Iakimidis uh, Rejwaji? The law of gravity. Do you have it? That if you throw a heavy thing up, it falls down. Do planes fly? But planes are high heavy. They're supposed to fall down if you throw them up. How comes they don't fall? They have another higher law than the law of gravity. Aerodynamics, eh? The law of aerodynamics, eh? What it does, it cancels the law of gravity and the plane is able to fly. You see? So take the law of gravity as the sin nature and take the Holy Spirit as the law of the aerodynamics which is able to Fly, propel you beyond the, the law of gravity. It's in nature. Amen? Amen. Makes sense? Yes. Good. So we are saying here, consequently, the corrupt sin nature separates all men from God in time and eternity. So the death of Adam in the Garden of Eden, which was transferred to every single man, has consequences on all the entire human race, and that's the consequences are... The condemnation is that you are in time separated from God and eternally separated from God. That is the condemnation. So, the Bible says in Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So, when the universalist comes and tells you that there's no, nothing called separation, that you are never actually separated from God, you have a scripture here. That the sinfulness of man had separated man from God and his iniquities, the natural tendency to sin, had closed the ears of God that even if you pray and cry, God will refuse to hear. Not that God will not hear your prayer. This is a metaphor to say even if God hears, he will not answer you because you are a sinner. Look at Ephesians 2, 3. It says, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. So we have the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Look at that. Children of wrath. We were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. What is the meaning of by nature children of wrath? The way you were born by your mother naturally, you are the objects of God's wrath. The God's wrath, the ultimate uh, uh, manifestation of God's wrath is when he sends sinners in the lake of fire. Every individual human being born on this earth, before you believe in Christ Jesus, you are by nature, by nature, naturally, the way you are born, you are naturally destined for hell. Naturally, the wrath of God is upon you. Okay, so let's look at what God does. Another truth that you need to learn. God, motivated by his own love, provided a satisfactory and efficacious remedy for sin through the sacrificial 
death of Christ Jesus at the cross. So there, there are three things that I want you to look at there that here God was motivated by his own love. Not by our deeds. Not by our goodness. Not by that these people will be good in the future. God, God stirred up himself with his own love. God did not need any outside influence for him to love us. He didn't need that. So motivated by his own love, that's the first thing that you need to understand, he provided. So God made a provision, provision for our sins. And you know what, what uh, Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, I don't know if we have it somewhere, that if you, you are a sinner, you must earn their wages. Wages is what you earn, isn't it? So every sinner must earn. God pays every sinner. And how does God pay every sinner? The wages of sin is death. death. So uh, God had to provide a righteous man to die for us on the cross to pay for the wages of sin so that we may also be uh, saved. You know, man struggles to pay for sins through repentance, confessions, good works, Christian service, a lot of religious things. Let me tell you the only way that you can pay for your sins. If you want to pay for your sins, there's only one way, to spend your eternity in hell. That's the only way you can pay for your sins. Nothing else will satisfy the justice of God. The only way the justice of God can be satisfied is when you spend your eternity in sin, Justice of God will say you have paid for your sins. And the second way was for the righteous man to die for us. A sinless man. And the whole humanity was, had a sin nature. So we look at it like this. All of us are in prison. We cannot help ourselves. We can help one another. So we need someone who is free from prison to come and help us out. And the only one who was free from the prison of sin was Christ Jesus. That's why he's the only one who is fitting for us. Amen. God provided. Now what God provided you need to understand here is satisfactory towards God because it's God who wanted to be satisfied not us. So towards God it is satisfactory. Towards us is efficacious. What is the meaning of the word efficacious? It's effective. And you can add that is eternally efficacious. <laughs> its effect is eternal. Eternal. So towards God, it is satisfactory. Towards us, it is eternally efficacious. Look at what Peter says in First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you are healed. So, the first part, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. So, Jesus, when he went on the tree, during the three dark hours, he was bearing our sins and the sins of the whole world. Why? So that we having died to sins, what does that mean? That when Christ was dying on the cross, spiritually, when you believe in him, you are counted as though you died with him on the cross. And therefore you died to sin. You are separated from sin. And from thence, you might live for righteousness. So the Christian life is dying to sin and living for righteousness. That's the Christian life. And dying to sin means separating yourself from sin and living for righteousness. And it's not something that you do, it's something that you achieve when you believe in Christ Jesus. Because at that time now, you become the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. And now your responsibility becomes to work out that righteousness and live in accordance with that righteousness. This is the one I love most. It, it is so explicit. First Peter chapter 3 verse 18. It says, for Christ also suffered, how many times? Once. Once for sins, the just for the unjust. A very important phrase here. The just, it means the righteous Christ Jesus, he died for who? 
the unrighteous humanity. That he might bring us to God. So this is why Christ is dying on the cross, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in his flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. So the purpose of Christ dying on the cross is that when you believe in him, he will reconcile you back to God. He might bring you to God. You know, you know uh, this, this uh, young man who are walking with Christ, was it Thomas, who said just, I know it was Philip who said, show us the Father and that will be sufficient for us. Eh? Is it Thomas or Philip? Philip in uh, uh, John chapter 14, verse 9, there about. Show us the Father and that will be sufficient for us. And uh, Philip had said, I want to, no, uh, Thomas has demanded to be shown the way, the way to where Jesus is going. But Philip thought that I can ask the same question, but technically. Because Thomas was not so learned, so Philip was so learned. So Philip asked it technically. Uh, just show us the Father and that's sufficient for us. Because as you show us the Father, you will be showing us the way at the same time. Yeah. So the, the purpose of Christ dying on the cross was to bring us, to bring us to God. No one can seek and find God. We are always brought to God. Yeah. That God is the one who seeks after me, not I seeking after the kingdom. <laughs> I know. So, I love this scripture because the just man died for the unjust man. And why did he die? So as to bring him, to bring the unjust to Christ, to God. And we all understand the only way he brings us to God is when we put our personal faith in his finished work at the cross. There are many other scriptures. Isaiah is a wonderful chapter. I think, I think we have covered it. Isaiah, verse by verse, verse this this. Uh, Romans 5, 6 to 8 is a wonderful passage. We'll look at it again today. And Hebrews 10, 1 to 18, wonderful passage of the Bible that you can see all that, how it happened. Yeah. The gospel is translated from a Greek word, euangelion. Greek theologians are here. Euangelion. And euangelion simply means is, uh, good news. So the gospel is therefore good news or a good message from God to the world concerning the finished work of Christ, Jesus Christ at the cross. Evangelion. That's why you are called a evangelionist, an evangelist. Uh, always when you hear, when you sit before the television to watch good news, what are you watching? Things that have already happened. They may have an impact in your life because if they say taxes have gone high, you may pay the taxes for a longer period of time, but you'll be told when they happened, then how they'll affect your life. So the goodness of God tells you what happened on the cross and how it will affect your life. That's why Paul says here like this, for I delivered to you first of all. When Paul says first of all, he means that that's the most important message in the world. You get it? Before you talk about uh, um, Arsenal, uh, Tuluwa Chapajana, Tumechej Coach, before you go there, before you talk about uh, who is our new president, how the cabinet looks like, before you talk about that, the most important message in the world is the gospel. You get it? For every believer, for every believer. You need to put the gospel at the forefront of your thinking every time. And uh, this, this has helped me so much. I never assume, I never assume that the person I'm meeting understands the gospel until we share. I never assume that this person understands the gospel until we share. And I, I must look for a way for us to, first of all, that's what Paul is saying. First of all. So I must look for a way we share the gospel, share the gospel. I hear that we are on the same. Then now we can move. Hello. Yeah, for a so, clarity purpose. Yes, Daniel. Well, I did not want, to go, want us to go far be, before we dealt with this area where we are sure of our salvation. That's where we are heading. To. That's where we are heading to. <coughs> 
and we say there are two things that are important in your life for you to be sure of your salvation is a clear understanding of the gospel and an evident manifestation of a transformed life. So we are just passing through the gospel because we have already done the gospel. We are just passing through the most important points in the gospel so that we can remind our minds with the clarity what the gospel is. Then we look at the evidence of transformed life. Correct. Yeah. Now, here comes a small question, but very tricky. Uh, <coughs> let me, let's hear the tricky question. Is there a way somebody can believe, I believe, there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a stage where you are saying you must believe to have faith in God and to become a child of God. Yeah. And here somebody say, okay, this, this is a corrupt, it's just told you to believe, then on the other hand he will deny you. Is there a fake belief that you must... Fake de belief. Yeah, somebody has, has just deceived you are a believer and then you come out later that you are not a, I'm not a believer. Is there a case like that? Okay. The question, the tricky question is over. Now let's see if I can get a tricky answer. Is there false faith? Is there fake faith? That's what Dan is asking. Is there a way that you can have believed, then you have not believed later? Yeah? Is there a way? Dan, just come for a minute. Come with that chair. Come with that chair. I like the way you sit. Just sit in that chair. Sit, sit in that chair. The way you normally sit, like, like uh, uh, that way. I like the way you sit. <laughs> so let's look at Daniel. Eh? Is he seated in this chair? Is there a time when he's seated in this chair that he can doubt the power of this chair? Is there a time? So let me ask you, can he be sitting here and wondering like for how long will this chair hold me? Okay, so, so it's okay. Let's try another style of sitting, like, like you doubt the seat. Like you doubt the seat. Yeah? Is he sitting on the chair or not? Is he sitting on the chair? Is the chair holding him? What is the problem with Daniel? Is doubting the power of the chair to hold him. But is the chair holding him or not? So does the chair hold him because he believes in the chair or because he doubts the chair? Does his faith in the chair matter anything? The, the chair does not change. He may doubt the chair. Yeah? Actually, he's even sitting better. Let me, let me show you. He can even sit like this. You know? You, you, you are not so sure if the chair will hold you, but the chair does not change. You are the one who is changing, but the chair's purpose still remains. You see that? And that's so with Christ. Once you have put, amen, once you have put your personal faith in Christ Jesus, he will always take you where he has to take you. Let me give you another good example, Daniel. I know those days you used to fly from Nairobi to Kisumu. Have you ever done that? You fly. Now, suppose you pay your ticket. <laughs> this guy is a low boy. You know they are doubting. These guys are doubting. Severally. We lose, we arrive. <laughs> we, we land. <laughs> we land. So, suppose you, are, you, are, you, are, you have paid your ticket, you have boarded the plane, and the plane has taken off. And then up there, you discover I am in the air. And say, this is not possible. You, you are a scientist. You know the Archimedes law. And you say, this is not possible. And you lie flat on the plane. Will you go to Kisumu or not? If you cry, will you go to Kisumu or not? If you hang somewhere at the court, will you go to Kisumu or not? So the plane is not going to Kisumu because of your behavior. The plane goes to Kisumu because the plane is going to Kisumu. It means like this. Once you hear the clarity of the gospel and you believe in Christ Jesus, you trust that his death on the cross is sufficient to save you, bestow on you eternal life, and the many other blessings of salvation. Once you believe that, you are uh, saved. You are a child of God. And from that day onwards, 
your security of salvation does not depend on what else you believe along the way, but on the power of God to secure your salvation to the end. You see that? And we are going to look at it in a short while. So, sometimes we may, we may change even and not believe that this chair cannot hold me. You may change and believe that this plane will not take me where I'm going. You may change along the way, but it doesn't change your destiny. It may change your comfort. People are comfortably sitting on their chairs in the plane, enjoying their wine or their juice, and you are on the ground, prowling on the ground, saying that you don't know if you'll get there. It may frustrate you on the way, but you'll get there frustrated. Asante, you've actually answered that question well, uh -huh. but when the presentation of, you know, the, the good news, there is the clarity of the gospel, and somebody believes only what it doesn't matter now on actually how he continues to believe, but actually it matters on, you know, God's power to hold him through till, you know, Christ returns, or maybe young years the eternal life for forever. But then, when you look at First Corinthians chapter two, verse one to five, when Paul is talking to you know Corinthians, when I came to you, I think that Nick can be can be yeah from the screen. Then you explain to us just you know a bit. You see, I can read it for you by then. Let me start. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. Mm -hmm. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith, your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So there is that faith that can be, I think, in the wisdom of men, and I think that faith does not save when the gospel is not, pre you know, it's not in its clarity. That, when it's another gospel, I think so. Uh, when Jesus was uh, teaching about uh, the multitude not to worry, in Matthew 6, 33, mm -hmm. he says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. So the word, seek. but seek. Okay. Seek. What is our, what is our portion? So what is our responsibility let, there? Let's, let's, do, let's do... Yeah, I just wanted to amplify on my brother's question here. Uh, as in, is there a situation where someone can think they are saved, but in the real sense, they are not? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. So let's just deal with that first. Wait, uh, George has just summarized the question. Sydney Mephodish Hermanetics. Eh? So first, who is Paul talking to? What is known about the Corinthian church? Leave alone, they, they became immoral, but before they hear the gospel, they, had, they were rich. They were people of uh, 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 knowledge. Yeah? Eh? Before they got saved, eh? there are people of knowledge. There are people you can, can't just approach. Like right now, there, yeah? they are very rich. Right now, if someone go, told you there's a group of lawyers that you need to talk to, then you find Orengo sitting there. You see, that, that's the situation that Paul was facing when he was talking to the Corinthians. So you have you need to have your hermeneutics right, uh, cultural, contextual, historical. Lexical, <laughs> syntactical. <laughs> so let's look at this. And I, brethren, now these are already believers because they have already believed in Christ Jesus. When I came to you, so he's telling them, when I came to you before you believed in Christ Jesus. Is it so? Yes. I came, did not come with the excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. He says, I didn't come like in the way that you speak with great oratory. I didn't have the kind of wisdom that you have, but I just came doing what? Declaring the wisdom of God. So let's move on and see. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I don't want to know if it's Dr. So-and-so. I don't want to know if it's engineer so-and-so sitting there. 
I don't want to know if there is a billionaire sitting there. The only thing when I'm standing before you, I want to know what? Jesus and him crucified. Okay. So, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. Of course, when you are preaching to rich people, <laughs> people who know how to talk, they are better than you. Maybe even the shoes you are putting on, they are the ones who have donated. You, you know you don't know how to talk to them. So Paul says, I was with you in fear. I was with you in weakness. Most theologians think these weaknesses is because Paul was a sickling all through his, his ministry. I, had, I don't know. This is not biblical truth. It's what, what I believe. Paul had a problem with his eyes. They were troubling him always. He had no clarity in vision. And he was sickling. That's why he even called Dr. Luke to work with him for some time and help him along the journey. So weakness may be his bodily infirmities. And then in fear, yes? No, Paul was a very confident. He was a violent man when it comes to things of the spirit. You can't put him there. <laughs> his weakness must just be bodily uh, weakness, infirmities. Then in fear and in much trembling is because of the people that he was talking to. And much trembling also may be that will I present Christ accurately to these men. Look at them. They are so learned. They are so rich. They are so, they have everything. You see, uh, we were somewhere uh, with the Chris and Sarah and we were talking to a friend and he was telling us, my friends, when you go to stand before people, look at the way you stand. Because you, someone can come to you with a coat that is oversized, is hanging on the fingers, and people are saying, now we are not doing it at Uberia Leo. <laughs> so even the way you present yourself can make you feel like, am I worth? You know, your status may make you feel like, am I worth to stand before these people? But Paul is encouraging you, your confidence will not be in the way you look like, but the message that you carry. In verse 4, and my speech and my preaching were not with the persuasive words of human wisdom. Now he has introduced human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and the power of God. So the spirit and of power. So what Paul is saying, you have people who know culture. Think about going to preach to Njurinjek. They understand the culture of the male world. They understand everything. They have human wisdom. You know, Back in the days of Jesus Christ, even in Mark chapter 7, they had what they were, call, they were calling what? Uh -uh, they, they had come, they, 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 what the Pharisees had done, they had divided the law of Moses to a level that it has lost its official, original meaning. They had come up with the traditions of men as now the basics for a uh, uh, righteous life. And there are people who have that. You can't challenge them. They have, you know, you must do eight years of philosophy. How will you convince that kind of man unless you have the power of the Holy Spirit? That's what Paul is saying there. There are people who have the wisdom of men. They understand the human traditions. They, are, they understand the education things. They understand the philosophies. And Corinth, you know, with the philosophy. Yeah? Corinth is a place of philosophers. So, Paul says... I did not come with these things that you already have, human wisdom. I came in a higher power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So now we are looking at education, we are looking at culture, we are looking at philosophies. All of them, Paul is putting them together and calling them human wisdom. And that's something that is even happening in our congregations even today. Yeah. You, you, you listen to the philosophies being taught people. I saw a clip somewhere. I just laughed. Someone said eh, the, the reason why morning hours are called AM is because the I am is more operating in the morning. Uh, George, have you seen that clip? You've seen it, eh? And people were like, yay! And he was, the guy was like, he has a, he has a revelation. <laughs> My friends, I am is in the morning. And when he says, I am is in the morning, the whole church is on its feet. You know, we were dealing with the I am. I 
And this is what your brothers are listening to every Sunday. Your brothers are listening to how to break curses. You see, and human philosophies, human philosophies. Your brothers are listening to the signs of the devil. When you go to someone's house, if they like red clothes, if you see this drawing on the wall, if you see this sign, you are always, you are in somebody's house and you are keen, eh? looking at <laughs> you, you, People are listening to things outside there. People are listening to things. Philosophies and philosophies and philosophies, never backed by the word of God. The word of God is read at the beginning, then there's a deviation from the word of God to what the man of God wants to teach you. Okay? And people go there, and they say they are born again. There are so many people. I had a lengthy talk uh, with someone yesterday, and he was telling me that what, you are, what we are doing in Africa is commendable. It's even becoming impossible to preach the gospel because these people are too, they have too much knowledge. Too much knowledge that they have no space for the gospel. So you go, you go to teach people the gospel and they tell you scientific things that you, you yourself even don't know. You see, you know, you, it's very easy for you to sit here and believe that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and you say you know the word of God. You've never met someone who can tell you scientifically how this word was always created until your faith is shaken. And if you are not strong in your faith and in the power of the Holy Spirit, you may think maybe this guy is right. And my brother, there are churches there right now that can just sit to hear archaeology. And the whole year, they are looking at archaeology and the formation of the stones. They are looking at uh, the formation of the stars and everything. I, 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 I have learned that myself. Until I asked myself, what is this I'm learning? And someone can be in that congregation and say, he is born again. You see that? It's only until someone hears the clear presentation of the gospel that they get the distinction between the two. Because when you, the gospel is presented clearly, the Holy Spirit takes that gospel, goes in the heart of a man, convinces him, convicts him to see that everything he has been believing in is useless and this is the real thing, and then now he believes. So yes, there are people in many congregations all over the world who in their own thinking, they know they are born again. They know they are born again. There are people today who know, many people that you know, who know that you cannot talk to Jesus directly, you must talk to him through another lady who is more favored than more other women. Highly favored. Many people right now, they, they don't go to Jesus. They go to this girl who is highly favored. And they tell her to go and talk to Jesus on our behalf. If you ask them, are you Christians or not, what will they say? They are believers. But have they believed in Christ Jesus? No. Do they have a clarity of the gospel? No. No. It's only by grace that you are saved through faith. And that's not of yourself. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man. And that's why you have a lot of work to do. Seek here first the kingdom of God. <laughs> When Christ came, what, what was he preaching? Repent. Repent for the kingdom of God. What were the Jewish people supposed to seek? Are you seeking the kingdom? The Jewish people were supposed to receive their king that he may rule from Jerusalem and rule the whole world at that time. That's why they have been told, seek your kingdom. Me and you are not seeking the kingdom right now. Because once you believe in Christ Jesus, the king himself lives in you. The king himself now dwells in you. So you don't go seeking for the kingdom. Let me say this generally, and I, I wish we get enough time in this class to go up through it. Most of the things taught in the Gospels were never for the church. Because Jesus Christ, are you hearing me? Yes. Jesus Christ never came physically on earth for the church. He came for the nation of Israel. The church begins at the cross. And Jesus has said it in, in many scriptures. Uh, Matthew 15. He said it. I don't know why people don't want to hear it. 
said it. Matthew 15, verse 24, but let's begin uh, at 22. It says, And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord. This is a Canaanite woman calling Jesus Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon possessed. Now look at verse 23. But he answered, Who is this answering? He answered her not a word, and his disciples came and urged him, saying, send her away, for she cries out after us. Do you think these disciples were wrong? No, this is a Canaanite woman. She's not a Jewish woman, and she, she wants something that is uniquely for the Jewish people. And Jesus never answered her word. Do you know an incident where Jesus, the Bible says in the New Testament that you will pray and God will not answer? Do you know anywhere in the New Testament from, okay, let me say from Acts to Revelation where, because <laughs> that's, that's, that's the real New Testament <laughs> to Revelation where there is a, that you can pray and God will not answer. Okay, so let's see. Why is Christ not answering this woman? So he answered not a word. Look at verse 24. Peter and the rest are saying, Lord, if you look at that, Peter is, is right in telling this, the Lord, eh? send this woman away. The disciples are right. Uh, 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 okay, you, you people come from families that have plenty. You know, you know, when I was growing up, we used to have like one serious meal a day in the evening. So mama has prepared a, a meal, ugali and kunde. And then you see the neighbor's children coming home. Mama, who's our daughter? Because that, that ugali is not even sufficient for the... We used to be eight in our family. We used to sit, sit around like this and the ugali is put in the middle. And then you are seeing the neighbor's children coming. You are telling mama, can you finish with them outside there? This is how the disciples were feeling. You get it? So look at the next... Uh, um, now how Jesus responds to that. But he answered and said... Look at this. Can we read all of us together? Is this Christ saying? Yes. If you have your Bible, that's what, those are red words. They are red lettered. Yes. Christ saying, I have not been sent to the Gentiles apart from the Lordship of the house of Israel. That this is some truth you need to soak in. That the physical life of Christ on earth was never meant for you. Yes, there are beautiful principles in the gospel that we can glean from, just like we can glean from other prophetic books in the Old Testament, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke are never written to you. John writes later after the cross, so we, because John writes to say, Jesus is the Lord, and if you believe in him, you get saved. So John is different, because John gives his... Um, the reason why he's writing his books. He always gives the reason why he's writing his books. I'll show you in a little while. But I want you to soak in that truth. Let's go back there. I want you to soak in that truth. That the gospel, as you study the gospels, yes, there are wonderful truths in the gospel. But you have to see what belongs to us and what must remain to the Jewish people. And a larger part of the gospels is the Jewish people. And Jesus himself has put a disclaimer here Verse 24, this is a disclaimer. I was not sent except to the lost ship of the house of Israel. This is a disclaimer that you cannot look down upon. So look at how this woman says. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Jesus has just told her, go away. I have, I have no ministry for you. Go away. I have been sent to the nation of Israel. You go away. But this woman comes and worships Christ. When you hear worship in the Old Testament is to prostrate on the ground and kiss the feet of the one you are worshipping. It's not what you say. That's not worship. It was to prostrate flat on the ground and kiss the feet of the one that you are worshipping. That was worship. So that's what this woman did. And the disciples were standing there like this. They were not worshipping. I want you to see the picture. 
Peter is there, Andrew is there, I mean, they are guarding what is their own, and there's one woman who comes and uh, prostrates on the ground and kisses the feet of Christ Jesus. And what does Christ answer? She says, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the, who are the little dogs? The Gentiles. The Gentiles. Okay. So let's move on. And she said, yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Lord, just feed your children whatever falls down here. I need it. I need healing. You give them the biggest part. <laughs> whatever falls down. That's what I need. And this moved Christ Jesus and he says, then Jesus answered and said to her, O oh woman, great is your faith. Let it, be, let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Do you get it? This woman now understood things beyond what the Jewish nation understood. She understood this man will die on the cross for the sins of the whole world. And after that, salvation will not just be for the Jewish people, it will come even to the Gentiles. And that's why she could continually call Jesus Lord. There, there are so many instances that Jesus has used to teach. You remember when the, the Greeks came saying, we want to see Jesus, we want to see Jesus. And Andrew told them, hold on, hold on. And Philip, is it, is it Philip who told them on Andrew? Andrew and Philip used to work together. And they tell Jesus, these, these Greeks are looking for you. And Jesus never answered them. He said, a grain of wheat must first fall on the ground and die. Then when it sprouts. So he, he talked about his death on the cross and the ministry he will have after he has died on, on the cross. He answered the Greeks without, because they were philosophers. Greeks are philosophers. They understood that my ministry to you will be effective when I die. When I come from the ground, you will benefit. You will know me. Where is it? Look at this. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. You know what he's saying? For you Greeks to have full benefits of my ministry, this must first happen. Okay? Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Jesus was now looking at us Gentiles, saying, relax, relax. Your time is coming. Okay, let's go to chapter 10 again. I'm trying to answer your question in many. Let's go to chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Enjoy. And when he had called his 12, look at this. When Christ had called his 12 to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits, to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases. Now, forget about the names. Let's go up to verse. These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, look at this. Let's read this together. Are you seeing that? Jesus is saying, do not go in the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost ship of the house of Israel. Even the ministry of the, the, the twelve was limited, during Christ's time on earth, was limited to the nation of Israel. Don't go and minister to a Gentile. How does that sound like? Discrimination here. <laughs> yeah? So, I, I come to this house, there's a Jew staying there, there's a sick person there, receive healing, the Gentiles say, please, say, no, 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 no. You go to the next house of a Jewish brethren. The, you know, it's, it's very clear. The ministry, he was giving the Jewish nation the first opportunity to receive him as their king. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Romans 1, 16. Things that maybe you've not seen in the gospel, as you, in the, these scriptures as you read. 
says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Now, listen to that. For the Jew. Ah. It was given to the Jew first. Let's go to Acts 28. Is it 28? The Jewish nation was given the first priority because it was the chosen nation of God. It could have been any other nation, but it's the Jewish nation that was the chosen nation of God. So, verse 25. Acts 28, verse 25. So, when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had said one word. The Holy, now, this is the one word of Paul. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah, the prophet to our fathers, saying, Go to these people and say, Hearing, you will hear, and shall not understand. Seeing, you will see, and not perceive. Verse 27. For the hearts of these people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Now look at verse 28. Therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. Ah. Paul, at the end of ministering with the Jewish people, he says, Mujue. Whatever is happening among us you was prophesied by Isaiah. Now, quickly you need to understand, a natural man, a person who is not born again, even if you say scriptures to him, that person is dull of hearing and cannot understand the scriptures. That's why the Jewish people rejected Christ Jesus. Everything that he had, they rejected him, and instead they crucified him. They offered him for crucifixion. And Paul says, the Gentiles were here. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had a great dispute among themselves. Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. But the Jews had done what? Walked away. Are you seeing that? So first, the offer of salvation was given to the Jewish nation. First. Now, just quickly, sometimes some Bibles interchangeably use the word, the phrase, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. But they are two different things. The kingdom of heaven is a king from heaven coming to rule literally on earth. Okay. And that was offered to the nation of Israel. They rejected it and it will be again be offered to the whole world after the great tribulation. Because what we are waiting for right now is rapture, then seven years of the great tribulation, then 1,000 years of the kingdom, and that's when, when how, what could have happened to the Jewish nation and the whole world if they had received their Messiah will be now played out in the millennial period or 1,000 years rule of Christ on earth. Okay? But the kingdom of God is in a sphere where now we have believers doing the will of God. Living righteously and presenting God, we have the kingdom of God there. Allow me to move so that we can go back to our notes. We are saying the gospel is the good news. I wanted us to look at this scripture briefly, then we can go to what. For I deliver to you, first of all, first of all, of first importance. The word first of all here will mean to you of first importance. Uh, that, that which I also received. So scriptures, uh, the, the teaching about salvation is received and Paul also received. That Christ died for our sins. Now this is the summary of the gospel. If someone asks you what is the gospel, you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4. That's the summary of the gospel. And this is the summary. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. This is the whole gospel. 
in the whole. And that's where our life dwells throughout. So the gospel message entails the person of Jesus Christ. So it entails his deity, that Christ is God, and his humanity, that Christ is man. I know you know this already. We have gone through it, didn't you? Yeah. So the Christ is God and Christ is man. We have looked at that. There are so many scriptures that we have looked at. And then the work of Jesus Christ. So his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension to heaven, and his sitting on the right hand of God. The, maybe the, the last part I can just tell you something about it. The reason why Christ is sitting in heaven is just to, is the first human being to sit in heaven as a sign that all of us, when we die and we are glorified, we will go to heaven. That's the outline of the gospel. And when you are, you are preparing your message on the gospel, if you want to preach the message of the gospel, this can be a wonderful outline. Yeah? A wonderful outline. There's a third part of it. The human response to the gospel is important also. After you have outlined the finished work of the cross, then you need the human response. And uh, you don't force a human response because the Holy Spirit produces the human response in a person. Once you proclaim the gospel, that's all. Don't force someone. Last more wamini, apana. So we have a positive response, which is faith alone in Christ alone. We have a negative response, which is a rejection of Christ and his finished work as an efficient means of attaining salvation. If you look at this human response, you realize that you believe in Christ Jesus, you have eternal life, you reject Christ Jesus, you are condemned. So Jesus is the central man of the universe. If you believe in him, you have eternal life. If you reject him, you got condemnation. You need to note that sin is not mentioned here. Sin is not mentioned here. So, number four, the results of the human response. Faith in, Jesus, in Christ results into a guaranteed, risk-free, eternal life and the absolute assurance of salvation. Rejection of Christ Jesus results into eternal separation from God into the lake of fire. We have enough scriptures there that you can make reference to. Salvation is therefore a gift of God to the sinner who believes in Christ Jesus. Salvation cannot be obtained or earned by human efforts, cannot be deserved by any man, and cannot be lost by any act of man. Wow. Cannot be lost by any act of man. And that's why we have this powerful scripture here in John chapter 5 verse 24, most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. If you have to preach on this scripture, you can break it into four. Number one, he who hears my word. So the first aspect of salvation is that someone must hear a clear presentation of the gospel. Someone must hear. Now, what does, why does Christ say, and believes in the one who sent me. Think about it. This Christ is not saying and, and believes in me. He says believes in the one who sent me. So what does the one who sent Christ say? He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So believe what God is saying is true, that he loves you, he sent Christ Jesus died for you on the cross, and if you believe in Christ Jesus, you have eternal life and you'll never perish. If you believe that God says it means business there, then you are saved. That's the message of the gospel. And then so we have, uh, he who hears my words and believes in the one who sent me, so we have the results of believing, number one. We have what? Everlasting life. Number two, you will not come into judgment. That means no condemnation. And number three, he has passed from death into life. In other words, you are dead and now you are living and you will never die again. You see, you can take John 5.24 and preach a whole conference on it. Because if you, are, you have to, to preach what is God speaking to the world, so what are you about to, to believe about God, and you preach things like, and God demonstrates his love in that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. So you are saying what God has done for the world. So you, you can look at what God has done 
as one aspect. Then look at uh, the human response, the believing and rejection. You can go throughout the Bible looking at that. Then you can, you can look at those three things that you attain. Number one, everlasting life. You can explain what it means. Number two, uh, no judgment, no condemnation. You can explain what it means. And number three, that you have crossed over from death into life. You know, most evangelists believe that we have life that we give to Jesus. But the truth is, at the point of salvation, you are dead in your sins and your transgressions. You are the one who receives life from Christ. We don't give our lives to Christ. We receive life from Christ. But now, once we have received this life, we can tell Christ Jesus that the life you have given me, I give it back to you now to serve you all the days of my life. Praise God. Uh, this is an assurance, uh, an assurance scripture. We'll look at it later. Uh, John 6, 37 to 40. So, therefore, the gospel is the only means by which a sinner can be saved and the only basis of judgment for those who reject Christ Jesus. Uh -huh. You see the importance of the gospel? A sinner can be saved the, by, through the gospel. The gospel is the only basis of judgment. There's nothing else. And that's why you must have the accurate presentation of the gospel. Don't mess with the gospel. Don't mess with the gospel. It's a, mean, it's a matter of life and death. Don't mess with it. You can mess with tithing. <laughs> you can mess with Christian service. But when it comes to the gospel, you need to be accurate. Very accurate. That is not what man does to achieve salvation. It is an absolute dependence, an absolute trust, an absolute reliance, an absolute faith in what Christ has done for us at the cross. You can mess with something else, not with the gospel. I don't matter even if you want to teach 21 ways of breaking curses, seven keys to a happy marriage. What? <laughs> But first of all, have clarity on and the gospel. If there is something that this institute wants to insist on, it's clarity on the gospel. Let's differ on other things. And we can, differ, we can agree to differ on other things. But not on the gospel. Look at this scripture here. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Look at how important the gospel is because the gospel is the message about Christ Jesus. You see that? Uh, we, we need to break for our but in the next five minutes, but give me Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 verse 1. I want you to look at this. Paul, a born servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the so Paul says, Miss Nakazingine, look at that. I have no work, other work. Other people want to do deliverance. Other people want to teach marriages. Others want to teach business commerce in the church. Others want to teach what Paul says. Uh -uh. I only have one responsibility. He is set apart, separated, set apart, sanctified for the gospel of God. That's how important it is. Now look at this. So what is the gospel? This gospel which was promised before through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. Paul is saying this gospel is not a new thing. It was promised through the prophets. Okay. Number three, we are still looking at the gospel. Eh? So we can, let's, let's remove verse two. Say, Paul, a born servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel concerning his son, Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. So the gospel concerns who? Jesus Christ. Unless you are preaching about Jesus Christ, you are not teaching the gospel. And you are preaching about his, his birth, his death, his, uh, his uh, burial, his resurrection, and the ramification of all that to the life of whoever believes. That's why you hear People saying they are gospel singers and they are singing about themselves. They sing about themselves and they say they are gospel singers. If you want to be a gospel singer, you sing about who? Christ Jesus. People sing about themselves. They sing about things. People give their testimonies, what has happened in their life, how they bought a car. 
They bought a house. And they say that's the gospel. But then let me ask you a question. Is there anything that a believer can achieve in this world that an unbeliever cannot achieve? Can a believer buy the best car that an unbeliever cannot buy? Can you have a house that an unbeliever cannot have? Can you have land that an unbeliever cannot have? So, you need to, eh? you need to understand that the gospel is something greater than what the world offers. Something deeper, something more glorious than what the world offers. And you cannot start looking at the, the, the successful man manifestation of the gospel by what you have or what you don't have. That's why, that's why Paul understands and says, although I'm weak, but I have the power in me that all of you don't have. You see that? With that assurance in you, you can preach to anybody. You can say the believers get degrees. Many believers get they get permanent head damages. PhD is a permanent head damage, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So you get a permanent head damage, and any believer gets it. But when it comes to the gospel, it's something far much greater and deeper and more glorious than a PhD. That's how we need to start looking at life. Don't look at, at life as a gospel is a car, is a house, is land, is property. You, 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 you can miss all that and be like Paul and tell them I come to you in trembling. Fear and trembling. But in the power of the gospel. <laughs> so, this is a simple, it, it has put the whole world on two sides. Those who believe and those who don't believe. Have you seen them saying those who sin? Does the Bible say those who sin will go to hell? Those who don't believe in Christ Jesus. The world is divided into two by this scripture. Okay. And this one says the same thing in a different way. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So what is the most important thing in the world? To believe on Christ Jesus. Who is the most important person of the universe? Jesus Christ. If you believe in him, these are the results. If you don't believe in him, these are the results. And that's why the gospel must center on Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. Um, okay. So I want us to break for 15 minutes, have a cup of tea. We have a lot to cover today, and we will cover it. <laughs> we have a lot, and we'll cover it. Amen. Father, we thank you for such things that you are instructing us. And we thank you that you have given us the power to be able to sit down and uh, patiently listen to the word you, that is being taught to us and believe what is being taught to us. And uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, put it in practice and uh, use it to teach others, even as Paul instructed, that the such things you have heard from me, teach it to other faithful men. We thank you even for the cup of tea that is prepared for us and whatsoever, whatsoever else. Lord, we pray that you sanctify it and bless it, that as we partake of it, it will nourish our bodies to your good and give us the strength to continue uh, sitting here and learning. Have your way and be glorified. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Grace for Transformation Kenya. Every new subscriber is a great blessing. Dear friend, you may have watched this message and yet you are not born again. It is not an accident, but God's plan. All you need to do now is believe that Christ Jesus died on the cross and settled the penalty of all your sins. When you rely only on this finished work, you become the righteousness of God because all your sins are forgiven. You become a child of God with all the rights of a son. You will never perish because you have eternal life, the very life of God. You're welcome to worship with us every Sunday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. We are located at Umoja Inako Estate along Moy Drive. Directly opposite the Umoja 2 Chief's Office, Nairobi, Kenya. For inquiries, contact the registrar on 0722-898-340.